the show where anything goes. Motivation, mindset, recovery, philosophy, and life. We become who we are through what we experience. We all have a story, and this is My Backstory with Josh Boyer. What up, all my little peoples? Here we are on the My Backstory podcast with Megan Wilton in lovely Buddha, Buda, yeah, whatever, Texas. Um, I, I used to call it Buddha, but it's, I think it's Buda. I don't know. Beautiful. Maybe, I don't know. Buda, Texas. I guess but it's beautiful because there's nothing here except the Cabela's. Yeah, it's pretty gnarly. I mean, there was like literally nothing here 24 years ago when I lived here, but um, it's grown a lot. It's like part of Austin. You don't even really know the difference between like leaving Austin and getting into Buda. It's kind of like it's just all part of the same thing. I went the back way. So I went down. Like by Wimberley and. Went by the airport and they came back around because going down 35 is a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, because people are Austin drivers. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> they all come so, from California. So. <laughs> pretty much, dude. Like, uh, like Buda Kyle was like kind of like the California type area, you know, I think. Minus There's the water. Lot. Yeah. But like, and now like. I think like Austin and like Dripping Springs area probably have a lot of Californians. All like California money, you know, they sell their houses there and then move here because it's cheaper. Mm-hmm. Um, but whatever. Um, anyway, I want you to share your backstory. I think it's fascinating that um, number one that yeah you, know, you were in the military, which is super rad because so was I. I wasn't in the army. I should have. I mean, hindsight being twenty twenty, I should have joined mean, the army. Chair Force. No, I it mean, really is. It really is. My I mean, brother, was, my brother's in the Air Force. My yeah. grandfather's in the Air Force. I'm the first army. Yeah. So it's um like looking back on it, like being a young uh, kid, you know, crazy, full of testosterone and rage. I should have used that and gone to the army instead because, like, with the Air Force, if you're high speed and if you're like inspired and you want to like do something cool. Um, it's rare, you know, for, for you to be able to do anything. Like if you have a school you want to go to, it's like, you have to go jump through all these hoops, even to go to like pre ranger to get to ranger school. Um, it's really hard. So I think I got bored with it, you know, and like, you know, they say the, uh, was the idle time is like the devil's playground, you know? So it's like, I was just a fucking maniac. I mean, and I think if I was in the army, my energy probably would have been channeled in the right directions and I would have been a little better off. But anyway, it is what it is. I digress. Um, <laughs> So I want you to share your story about uh, going to the military, um, being an officer, how that happened, uh-huh. and um, being a overpaid physique, babysitter for sure, right? And a <laughs> uh, being a physique competitor. Um, I like I told you before uh, we started the podcast. Like I actually was prepping to do one, and I saw what the discipline and it's it's fucking nuts. I mean, the food that you're eating, the amount of water that you're drinking. Um, and you like level it based on like when your show is going to be type thing. Um, the working out and the cardio, like I, you know, I was doing carb loading. So, you know, 400, 300 or 400, 200, 200, 100, I think was my ratio of carbs. And the 400 day, I'd be like, fuck, how am I going to eat all these carbs? But you think you want them, you know, you think you're like, oh, dude, I love carbs. I love them. But seriously, on the 400 carb day, like I was struggling. Like I was like gagging down the rice. I was like, I don't know if I can. I'm like an internal fat girl. So uh, Uh, those days would be like, yes. No, I I couldn't do it. Like I think it maybe in week three or four, I think my body was like getting used to it. So I was ready for the 400 carb day. I was like, cool. I left a little bit heavier and like. Well, how long was your prep though? I think it was going to be a 12 weeker. But like I said, my my Mm. grandma died in the middle of me doing it. And then I was like, I wanted to drink all the beers and drown my sorrows. So I was like, nah, this isn't going to work. So I stopped and um, I think I'll probably do it again. Yeah, I'm going to do it again. Um, I don't know when, but I will definitely do it again. Because I'd I, recommend I, I like, like a 24 week. Oh, that's what I'm doing right now. A 24 week prep. So like those first 12 weeks, you're like, all right, I'm mentally into it. I already know how to food prep. I know how to, the working out part's really easy. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the easy part, at least for me. Yeah. It's the food part, being disciplined. And I'm like, God, I want, you know, pizza. And I want, you know, a cookie. I'm a, a sweet tooth is insane. So I have to find ways around that. Making protein brownies, they don't really satisfy me. But right. um, yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to let you share your story. Like where you grew up and what your life was like and oh, all that good stuff. Oh, man. Well, so you anxious? Are you nervous? A little bit. No, come on, you're good. I, I just feel like I've I've uh, lived a lifetime already. Yeah. Um, and I'm basically like pushing the restart button on my life right now. I'm back in grad school. 
Um, yeah. I'm getting my master's in exercise physiology. Sweet. Um, and everything I've done, you know, since I was like 18, when I went to West Point, going through West Point, going through the army kind of led me to that. So there was like a silver lining. Um, but I grew up in California, um, northern. Um, what part? Uh, Sacramento area, like Roseville. Yeah. It's yeah, like sure. it's like Pleasantville almost. So I really wanted to get away from that place. I don't. Definitely. I just never fit in. Um, it's very like blonde and fake boob type of community, yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like, what? And like, I'm, even in high school, like I really didn't fit in with my peer group because like I don't, I don't think I think better than other people or I think more abstractly than other people. But I just like I think beyond the box. So like. Yeah when these like kids like oh, let's go go party i'm like let's go like i don't know go to the library and go like pick out a book and like and read that or you know let's have actually like two people over at the house and with with alcohol right. you know because we're 16 and we thought we we're rebels and right. <laughs> i actually have a legitimate conversation about uh life yeah, for and sure. um I mean, I guess like I matured a lot more because I got a job when I was like 15. Like I want to make my yeah. own money. And my dad, he, I mean, we we're really well off, but right. he made me pay um, some for club volleyball because club volleyball was not cheap at all whatsoever. Right. And um, I got into that when I was 16. And it's very rare for kids to get into sports, uh, a new sport especially, um, that late because usually they kind of groom them since they're like 11, 12 years old, like even the girls I coach now, like they're 10, 11, 12 years old. I was personal training this 10 year old and she's already serving the ball over the net. And me, I was still picking my nose, you know, when I was like 12, 13, 14 years old, I was yeah. basically, I'm six one. So like uh, at that time I was like six foot and I was still trying to figure out my body. I was like basically like a baby giraffe. Yeah. Um, most of my life I actually have a tattoo of a giraffe. It's my spirit animal. Super cool. um, <laughs> my one tattoo that I have. And um, got into that, and I, God, I sucked. I was terrible. I was no coordination whatsoever. And for whatever reason, I made this, like, top team um, eventually when I was, like, 17. And I remember all the parents were just like, Megan's never going to play Division One volleyball. Like, n nothing's going to come out of this. And, like. Watch me. Yeah, exactly. So um, I just worked. All I knew was how to work my ass off. That's all I knew. Yeah. And um, eventually I got recruited. The very first school I actually got recruited by was Gonzaga. And the only reason why they came and looked at me um, for another match uh, was because I went back and picked up my teammates' water bottles. It wasn't the way I played. It wasn't um, how many blocks I had, how many, like, kills I had it was right. because I picked up my water my teammates water bottles and brought them with with me because my teammates forgot them so that kind of I was Team like player. cool right yeah. yeah um and we'll talk more about that later how I like coach girls now but um and then my junior year I went to this showcase in Sacramento and I met Jeremy Sands he was a the coach at West Point at the time. He actually ended up coaching at the Naval Academy. <laughs> oh, wow. Traitor. <laughs> I'm like, you're traitor. And I was yeah. like, Jeremy. He was an armor officer in the Army. Mm -hmm. um, I hate myself for this right now because he was mentioned in a book. And long story short, this this guy was a bad motherfucker, like, uh, at the height of the war. And, like, you would never know. Like, you right. have no idea when you meet him. Um I got recruited by him, and then eventually, like, God, like, West Point, like, what's West Point? I knew what West Point was. My family's military. And at the time, it was, like, 08, 09, and that's when, like, the recession happened. And my dad's yeah. like, you should really go to West Point. And So how does that work? Is it, like, a full ride? So, like, if you're, like, if you're getting recruited to play volleyball, they basically get you into the school and pay for all your tuition and all that good stuff? Yeah, you, like, you still have to have good grades and, right. and whatnot, to, but, I mean... There's plenty of classmates of mine that I knew they didn't have the best grades, but they uh, still made it through. And um, I think that's just kind of like that athlete mentality. Like, no matter what, you're going to, like, grind through it. And you even have 2.0, like, you're still going to be a second lieutenant compared to, like, somebody else that's a 4.3 GPA. If she's still or he's still a second lieutenant. So I was like, okay, whatever, cool. Were you, a four, were you one of the 4.3 years? No. I was, no. 
three point nine. <laughs> no. <laughs> um. No, like in high school, like I was good at school, but I prioritized my time with my job, and I was playing AU basketball still. I was playing volleyball still, and I was just trying to kind of like figure myself out yeah. still. Um. Yeah. So West well, Point's gnarly. So like. What like you just said you were like hey I'm gonna go to West Point that's where I'm going that's what, yeah that's where I went and uh, it was a nightmare <laughs> yeah it's like it's like, it's like being in like boot camp Sum, right? like four summing years. it up in whole it was it was a nightmare um, but volleyball that was my identity um, I still didn't know who I was and I was like okay volleyball is my thing and that's what I'm gonna be good at and that's what I'm gonna focus at obviously my academics because that was a nightmare it was like. At one point, I had like 24 credits a semester. And like at any Ouch. normal college, it's like if you have more than like 18 or 19, you have to get like a special waiver by the dean to even do that. Why'd you have that many credits? Why are you holding that? Because it's West Point. Level? It's like it's the same thing at Naval Academy and the Air Force thing. It's just this whole just mind fuck, basically. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, some really shitty things happened there. And can you talk about it? Uh, yeah. I mean, at this point, like. At this point, I'm comfortable talking about it because if these things did not happen, I would not be the coach that I am today, the the fiance I am today, the friend, the you know, you fill in the blank, the mentor, whatever yeah. that I am today because of those experiences. Um, the very first one, of my yearling year, which is yuck year, which is sophomore year, right. we have our weird names. Um, I had a boyfriend, and we broke up. And um, in today's society, we exchange photos, and uh, he sought out revenge on me, and he sent it out to the football team, the lacrosse team, the soccer team, the Corps of Cadets, basically. Wow. And I, I mean, even to this day, I'm just like, why would somebody do that? Like, that's so immature. But I mean, at the time, like, just because, like, just because you go to West Point, just because you go to some community college, whatever, it doesn't matter. Like, just because you go to a certain school does not mean, like, you're that type of person everybody else thinks you're supposed to be. Right. And um, this might be an unpopular opinion, but boys will be boys. And um, I was like, okay. And the superintendent at the time, I'm not going to mention his name, but he gave me two options basically we could either do an investigation and this is before sharp uh the sexual harassment and assault prevention program yeah i think that's what the acronym is um was really big um and he gave me two options so one i could either report everybody and have everybody's phone get investigated and basically be the 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 most well-known, is that grammatically correct? Most well-known um, cadet and eventually army officer in the army for initiating this investigation and getting like hundreds of cadets kicked out. Yeah. Or I could just brush me the rug. And at that time, I was just like, I really want to be an engineer officer. I really want to you know, go to SAP. I want to do all these things in the army. Like I can't have that um, hinder me from doing that. So I was like, all right, you know, whatever. I don't care. Of course I cared. Like it just, it ate me up inside. Absolutely just destroyed me. Depression, like anxiety, just always on edge of like. What was your biggest concern with that? I mean, I'm not a woman, obviously. So like, I don't understand like the dynamics. I think if like, and the reason I'm asking is because like for me, if my picture, you know, if I sent some provocative pictures or whatever to uh, my wife or girlfriend, whatever, and those were shared. I don't think I would give a shit. I'd be like, oh, you shared, but oh, cool. <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't think Sweet. It, well, I just Free don't think publicity. It, yeah. <laughs> Free advertising. I look good in that photo. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't think, uh, I don't think it would bother me much. Um, and I, I think, I think most dudes would feel that way. You know, like, I don't, I don't think they would care. I don't, I don't think. So what about it, like, for you was, like, embarrassing? Was that people, did you feel violated by that? Was it, like? Violated, and I think just even women at, uh, young women, we were young women at West Point. Like, we were already kind of, like, categorized as whores, sluts, whatever. Because, it, at the, you know, 
the normal ratio, I don't know what it is now, but when I went there, it was like four to one. Yeah. So four males to one female. Um, so I think it was just kind of like that that whole image and then like reputation. And uh, I, I just didn't want that. I wanted to be looked at as, you know, a, a strong female that right. uh, has the capabilities of being a really good leader in the army. And that's, you know, that played volleyball and that's, sort of smart sort of kind of maybe and then you know graduate and move on with my life um yeah it makes sense but what did you learn from that what was the biggest takeaway from the whole experience oh man um not to give a shit what people think about you yeah um and then eventually it led me to like my my phrase that i say to every by a woman mm -hmm. in the army that I meet or that wants to go in the army or is in the army is that you do not have to act like a man in order to get respect from men. Um, sure. And just be your, your authentic self because even then I wasn't being my authentic self because I was defensive. I was, you know, I, I thought everybody was like talking behind me or behind my back and I was just like always on edge and I'm like, I and mean, I was wasting so much emo emotional energy when I could have been channeling that toward, um, you know, my academics or uh, my military training or, you know, like literally anything else. Yeah. Um, How big is the, the like just, I guess, um, like in the um, entire college at West Point, like how many uh, people are in each class, like in your freshman class, how many people are there? Um, About 900 or so. So, it's not, so it's, not, it's not huge then. Yeah. So everybody. I mean, yeah. I still got like a sore thumb regardless. So yeah. they're like, well, there's that Megan Welton chick. You know? like, <laughs> that's the girl with the Nike photo. And like, I think. Sorry, I'm sorry <laughs> I'm laughing, dude, but it's funny. It's funny now, right? right. It's, it's funny now. And it and when I was still in, like I'd run into classmates all the time and like we would just, we'd laugh about it. And he then, then they would apologize. I think what made me mad at the time was that no one, well, I don't want to say anybody, but. No one came up and apologized to right. me for it. And not that I needed that, but. Um, it would have felt and, a little bit better, though. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. and I think it's a huge, like, uh, like that dude that did that, like your ex-boyfriend or whatever. Mm -hmm. He should have been kicked out. Not everyone that had the oh, pictures. He got ever. kicked out. He was dumb as a bag of rocks. Oh, like, I was saying, like, he yeah. should have been kicked out just for an ethics violation, dude. Like, come on, bro. Like, that's yeah. like you're gonna be, you're gonna be an officer. You're gonna be leading people. Like, and this is the kind of behavior. Like, but come on, I bro. I didn't throw him at the bus. That's the thing. I didn't give up a name. Um, right. I mean, at the end of the day, like it's all it's the responsibility is held on me. I'm the one that sent the photo. I'm the one that didn't say anything. You know what I mean? So like, I can't put 100 percent of the blame on him or anybody else that got the photo yeah i just felt disrespected as not just a woman like let's just eliminate that as a human being like right. well i'm sorry that this happened to you and maybe because i was like so selfish with my own emotions and what people thought of me like um maybe there were people that came up to me and tried to like apologize and i just didn't like you know realize it was happening right because i was just like woe is me um do you have any regrets about how you handled the situation like if you could do it all over again, would you do it the same way and not talk and not tell anything and just kind of like brush if under the rug? If I knew or? what I knew now, I wouldn't have reported it still because at the end of the day, it's still my fault. And, um, and in a weird sense, I'm glad it happened because uh, it kind of, it got me a chip on my shoulder, um, but it kind of gave me that tough skin. Yeah. that I needed to one finish and then um and then and later leader, I blew out my knee so just even mentally going through that like oh my god West Point was terrible um yeah be a leader basically and yeah. dealing with those kind of situations and sharp and and all that jazz so it's funny I uh I talked to my my cousin about this um and he's a, he's a manager and this and that and there were some things that um that he was like, he got in trouble for some things that maybe he shouldn't have. Um, but I was explaining to him, like, dude, the reason that you're getting in trouble for this stuff is because you put yourself out there too much with your subordinates. Yeah. They shouldn't know certain things about you. They, sh they shouldn't know, like, kind of what you're about. And um, certain things need to be close to the chest and you don't share those things. And I've been in positions of leadership where it's like, I want to be real with people, but at the same time, there's certain things I need to keep close to me because it's like, I don't want to get that close with you. You know, I'm, I'm still in a position of leadership and like, I love you and I care about you, mm -hmm. but sometimes leadership is a lonely position. It's that way for a reason, you know? And so like 
for me, like in your situation, I think what I would have taken from that probably is that don't ever give anybody leverage over me ever. Yeah. <laughs> ever, 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 you know, cause it's, it's brutal. Yeah. You know, that could have been, it could have been worse, I guess. You know what I mean? Like, and when you think about the mental torture that goes along with that, like that been terrible, you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not a woman, so I, I don't, I can't relate, but I can definitely empathize with that. I'm like, dude, that would have been a shitty feeling. You know what I mean? Imagine like my daughter, my sister, my cousin, or if something like that, like happening to them, I'd be fucking pissed, you yeah. know, for sure. But I mean, you have a good like mindset about it. Like, dude, I did it to myself. I, it is what I it is. I do now. Right. I do now. But at the time, no. And I just, I held all that in. Yeah. And then junior year, like, came along. I'm like, cool. This is a, a new start. Like, my attack officer at the time, um, we have like a mom and a dad basically of each company oh, at, the, cool. at the uh, academy. And he, I'm not going to say his name because I don't want, you know, yeah, good. investigation, but he just got promoted lieutenant colonel. So he's still kicking ass in the army. But um, he convinced me to stay. I wanted to leave after that. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, this school is supposed to have a certain reputation. Like, um, very selfish about it. And he's like, no, like, stay in. Like, you're going to be a good officer. I, I just know it. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, sir. Like, I have no idea, but I stayed. So um, the rule is the first day, of your junior year, you go to class, um, you're stuck. So if you get like kicked out day two after your junior year, you still have to serve time in the army. Because, oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, the the scholarship's on taxpayer dollars. So like you still, I mean, it's a $450,000 education, which blows my mind. But with all the training, uniforms and all yeah. that, it makes sense. Um, but junior year, like volleyball season, I'm like, cool, that's my thing. Like I was doing really well up to that point. And like I got rookie of the year my freshman year and I made first team my sophomore year. So volleyball is what I had. Like that's the one thing that kept yeah. me going to class every day. It kept me like somewhat sane yeah. <laughs> every day. And had an awesome preseason. The, the, the team were just like clicking on all cylinders and um, – at a tournament at TCU and like to this day my heart is still on that court we played TCU we took them to five and it was just like point to point and they ultimately won but I was just like I gave everything I gave everything that I had mentally physically emotionally um and there's a big difference between losing and getting beat and we got beat I mean they're a better team that's what they do right um and uh, so, and then like two weekends after that, I think it's two weekends. Yeah. Two weekends after that, we started conference play. So West Point for volleyball, at least we're in the Patriot league and, uh, it's a Makes smaller, <laughs> smaller league, yeah. you know, of the whole division one world. And, um, our sister competition, it was American university and Navy. And at the time when I was at West Point, Navy just sucked. So that yeah. was like our, or a uh, warm up game, yeah, yeah. and which is nice because we got a like cool little star on our jacket. But um, sorry, um, and then so we're American, we're we're warming up, and I go hit this slide ball, and it's it's called a C. So basically, like the setter sets the ball behind behind her, and I run behind her on the right side of the net, and I it's kind of like a layup almost layup, and you hit it down the line, and. I landed and I fell and I tried to get back up and I fell again. And I'm like, what's going on with my body? Long story short, I blew up my knee. Uh, so I was like, cool. ACL, MCL. Yeah, ACL just yeah. gone. And I'm like, cool. So not only there's a naked photo of me roaming around, you know, <laughs> God knows who, how far, like probably all the way to Afghanistan at the time. <laughs> No, no, I have to like crutch around on my knee, but you know, but I lost my identity. Yeah. You know, I lost yeah, my sure. volleyball identity. And um, is that like a wrap? Like when you tear an ACL, is it like you're not coming back from no. that? Yeah, it's like six to nine month recovery. It's right. just it's that rehab was brutal. Just like the mental part too. Oh, like for just sure. like laying there and was like, oh god, like yeah. what what was me again? Yeah. Right and. Um, and I'll say this, like when I was at West Point, like I, I'm a completely different person than I am now. And that's just a combination of going there and, you know, being a platoon leader and being in the army and now getting out. And now as a civilian, I just look at myself then and I wasn't a good teammate. I wasn't, uh, I was just a very angry person. 
Um, and I have reached out to teammates to apologize to them. Yeah. To say sorry, you know, like and he, w- some of them accepted it, some of them didn't. And I'm like, you know, like I got to move on with my life. Like, yeah, for I sure. know, I know this now, but um, just like with the whole picture thing and the the ACL thing, and by the time my senior year, like, um, I I would talk back to officers. I would uh, talk back to teachers, civilian teachers that I had, and. I basically said fuck you to one of uh, a civilian teacher that I had and I'm like that is just not my character like at all whatsoever I was just so angry what do you think it was you think it was just the combination of yeah. like the surgery the picture and you're just pissed off yeah and then it's just like West Point just sucks <laughs> like yeah. it's just oh, is it like is there any sense of normalcy at West Point as far as like a uh, like a normal like college um, or is it just constantly like just on like being on a grinder yeah I mean there's a bar on post but in that the cadets go to, but you can only drink if you're a junior or senior and you could have a car, but like the car parking lot is like two miles away. And you're just like, God, I don't even want to go to my car to like go into town to do anything. Right. And then you have so much homework. It's just like, where am I going to have time to go have fun? And I'm like retarded. So like I have to study extra hard. <laughs> so I didn't go anywhere unless we were like traveling for volleyball or something. Right. So, um, I just never got away. Like, I never got out of that, like, little bubble. Um, and, Maybe yeah. that was part of the problem, right? Because you're, like, just wrapped up in that shit. You know, it's yeah. like, sometimes when you feel like when you get away a little bit, it's like, ah, I can breathe a little bit, okay? Like, I'm not, like, I'm not there on that same campus doing the same shit with the same people. Like, just a little break, you know? It would have helped. I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah. Um. And then, yeah, I came back, uh, da, 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 graduated, shook Obama's hand. That was pretty cool. I mean, Super cool. Oh, I can say I mean, this not, now. I mean, not many I people. can say this now because I'm not in the Army. I was like, all right, thanks, sir. Have a good one. You know, uh, you know, smiling through my teeth. But right. um, did that. And then um, my first job in the Army was a strength intern for the strength team at West Point. It what was your major at awesome. West Point? Um, it was systems management and it's kind of like systems engineering, but like the, the par below the engineering, the STEM degree, um, which I, my brain was like so full of everything else. Like there's no way I could retain all the information and get that degree in the first place. Um, but, uh, I really like the systems major because like everything that I do in my life, like. I think about it systematically. I have to understand the entire system of something in order for me to understand like one part of it. So like yeah. if someone told me like, okay, do the derivative of, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, why are we doing this derivative? What, how do I apply this in the real world? And then I could come back and be like, oh yeah, okay. Like yeah. this is this is why you do the derivative. Um, who's calling me? Um, uh. Yeah, and then my first job in the army was a strength strength coach, basically. And it was awesome. And I never got to wear a uniform. Ever. It was great. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's what when guys are in the military, like or guys and girls are in the military, it's like that's like one of the best perks when you have jobs like that, where it's like, dude, I don't have to put a uniform on. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice. so by the time I got to my first duty station, I was promoted a first lieutenant within like the first two months. So I didn't have to deal with like the whole like butter bar stereotype and getting gailed at all the time and ncos treating you like shit so <laughs> what was your uh, first post um it was it was at west point so i i lived like in uh, highland falls that's like the town right outside of west point yeah. and i was there for nine months and i got to coach my own team i coached the men's tennis team that was very interesting uh, i learned a lot and then we did a lot of uh like social engagement so when general general ordierno at the time he was chief of staff he came on post like i would show him around or like team usa came with coach k coach k is a west point grad too is he really yeah i didn't know that yeah a lot super of interesting yeah like i didn't even know that you went to west point like i knew i wanted to do a podcast with you but this is like one of the things where like i'm like i don't uh, want people uh, i know well, i don't like uh i don't research a lot of people like before they come on the podcast mm-hmm. because i feel like it takes away from the conversation yeah so it's like while i'm talking to you i'm getting to know you and like so is everyone else on the podcast so it's pretty rad and i like doing it that way <laughs> so yeah so i think it's super, authentic yeah for i sure. like it yeah um like it. god who else came the new york knicks came so that was pretty cool and then the new jersey devils 
came in the gym and that was really cool. It was just a really cool assignment. It was yeah. just really cool. It was really lonely though because I was the lowest ranking officer on post. Right. Like clear, like everybody else is like a one star or colonel, lieutenant colonel, major. So I'm like, oh, okay, all right, cool. Um, and then I went to uh, Fort Leonard Wood for engineer basic leadership course. And that was six months. It's like the longest engineer or not engineer. It's the longest um, officer Bullock in the army. Is that, is that Missouri? Uh, yeah. Uh, Misery. Misery. Uh. So it was get Fort Fort lost in the woods. Um, uh. So yeah, that was six months. It was really cold and we do FTXs outside and my water in my canteen would be frozen. And I'm like, we're going to die. Like I'm going to die out here. Like I'm going to die. Like that's, <laughs> that's how I felt. And um, it was fun though. It was a lot of fun, like ruck runs and doing stuff on the weekends and just like being outside that kind of like that West Point bubble. You're a little bit free or yeah. Um, graduated that and then I went to Fort Hood and then I got a platoon two days later and then we were off on our first training at Fort Bliss. It was like 34 days long. I will never forget that. It was so long living outside. We ran out of water. We ran out of food, but it was so much fun. Yeah, yeah. Just trying to like figure out the logistics of it. I didn't know what I was doing. Me and my platoon sergeant at the time, um, we were split up. I'm like, cool. So I'm a brand new LT. I'm not even with my platoon sergeant. We're going to figure this out. And we did. And we're digging uh, tank ditches. And um, that's pretty much it. Like we dig like a thousand meter tank ditches for these like fake infantry units I would come in and right. um and fight the war on Atropia. Um it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Um but yeah. How many years do you have to give to the uh, army once you go to West Point? So five. So it's five years active, three years reserve. Um but my career was a little askewed. So um let's see platoon leader and then i worked with the colonel um after my two years as a platoon leader uh and then i just kept grinding on my knee so at at fort leonard wood i tore partially tore my acl again so i was like okay you know whatever it's fine it's fine it's fine i don't want surgery um ended up getting surgery at Fort Hood, recovered from that, and then I kept grinding on it. So I played for All Army Volleyball in 2016 and then 2017, and then I played for All Armed Forces Team USA in 2017 after that. Um, so I kept bouncing around on that. And then yeah. like, I'm not gonna like not run with my platoon. Like that you, like as a leader, like, first of all, I'm, I'm a female. Second of all, my platoon was all dudes. Like at that yeah. point, I think I had like two female soldiers 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 um so i'm like i'm not gonna like not run with my guys like that's ridiculous yeah. and we go i would take him like to the gym we do these like insane um like crossfit workouts and we like go like foreheads ginormous so we go clear across posts and just do ruck runs and run around doing crazy stuff and i just kept grinding on my knee grinding on my knee so after my platoon leader time and after I came back from uh, all armed forces volleyball, uh, I went to go see my surgeon just to kind of like check out my knee and we did an MRI and he basically was like, Meg. And he, Lieutenant Colonel, Ranger Tab, orthopedic surgeon, just a stud, yeah. Meg, you need to get out now or you're gonna get like knee replacement surgery in five years. Wow. And at the time, like, it was 50-50, I'm not gonna lie. Like, I really wanted to get out. Like, I had this um, this Navy CB guy, um, and they're like, I was in a construction unit. So the Navy CBs, those are the like construction guys in the Navy. And um, I'm pretty sure they have to have their STEM degree in order to be a CB. I could be wrong, but I don't know. Um, he was just kind of like rubbing me the wrong way and like, like stalking me at my house. That's it was, it was really strange. I was like, Ugh. and then like whenever we go to training events, like my NCOs and my soldiers sometimes would even have to like tell 
uh, higher ranking like officers or NCOs, like you can't talk about my platoon leader like that, you know, um, that's, that's rude. And that's like sexual, you know, harassment, which I'm like, I don't care, you know, like whatever, like I'm here to do a job and my job is to take care of 40 dudes. That's my job. And, and that was just like emotionally, like just on the inside, it was just like, God, like no matter what I do, or no matter how well I did, like my OER is really good, but um, it was emotionally exhausting. Um, and that I had extremely toxic leadership. Uh, my first company commander, like he was just never around, no guidance, no. Um, which was frustrating. So a lot of the things I learned in my first year as a platoon leader was by myself, just reading manuals and ARs and, you know, relying very heavily on my NCOs and like, um, I know the stigma of like West Pointer is like ring knocker, right? Yeah. Um, like I know how to do everything and we're going to do it my way or the highway. And I was just, I wasn't like that at all. I'm like, I need your help. Like I would, even the plaque I got after I was done with my platoon leader time, they had made for me. It was like, thanks for your like leadership and you know, all these other fancy words and your 1000 million questions that you asked every single day. <laughs> and <laughs> Don't know if you didn't ask. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, because I didn't know anything. Like, I need help. Um, and I think, I, I guess that's like my biggest, biggest accomplishment in the army was that even though everybody else on the outside wasn't the best to me, yeah. um, I had respect for my platoon. And that's when I go back to you don't have to act like a man in order to get respect from men. Because mm-hmm. I was myself, like, they would bring me coffee sometimes. And you know, your soldiers like you and they make fun of you. Because right. when your soldiers don't make fun of you, they don't like you. Right. Um, one of my guys told me that. They're like, they make fun of you because they like you. I'm like, oh. Um, <laughs> and then. And you shoot tobacco. So it's like. Oh, you, God. I mean, you're, you're totally, <laughs> totally cool in my book. <laughs> I've only met a few women in my life, actually, that, uh, that shoot tobacco. And uh, I think it's kind of cool. You know? It's an anxiety thing. I, I don't know. I get really worked up about things just yeah. even coming here i'm like what am i gonna say like am i gonna like screw up like am i gonna say everything i want to say Stop. what do i want to say you know like i don't even know that um uh but it just calms me down yeah. um i'm able to get stuff done and i don't drink either so i haven't drank since 2017 um by like why just, by, just uh, one's really expensive it's yeah. very expensive when you go out. I don't drink either, by the way, but I just was wondering why you stopped. It, it's just like unwanted calories. Um, people do stupid stuff when they're drunk. Um, makes you bloated. Makes you feel like shit the next day. Not like, for sure. So I, I calculate like every minute of my day. So I'm just like, okay, so if I drank, then I'm wasting X amount of minutes on Sunday yep. when I could be doing X, Y, and Z instead yeah. moving forward with my life. So... Most people don't ever think of it like that, you know, and that's kind of where like, I tell people like, they're like, oh, you, you stopped drinking? Like, oh, wow. You know, they expect like some gnarly story of like this raging alcoholic that's like being all crazy. And then I had to stop drinking because if I didn't, I was going to kill myself. But it's like, there are some stories like that, but I just wasn't that guy. I was like more of the, okay, I'm going to drink, I'm going to get fucked up. And then the next three days are going to suck and I'm going to be completely useless. And so I just kind of got to a place where I was like, I want to make the best of my life and also like just get rid of things in my life that don't serve me yeah exactly like, alcohol doesn't serve me like it's like sure it's a great social like lubricant you know to like go out because i have like anxiety whatever and i'll be in, in social settings it was easier to just be a little little buzz and you kind of like relate a little bit better but i don't know man I, I i felt like like not drinking like i feel more powerful now you know i definitely feel more safe in public you know because it's like I'm, I'm dialed in. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm good. You know? Exactly. <laughs> like, and then you're the, always the DD. And I'm right. like, I don't mind. Like, I don't have I'm, to worry about how to get home. Like, <laughs> totally good. I don't have to worry about my car being towed. I don't have to worry about, like, my parking ticket being $500, yep. especially in Austin. Um, I'm just, I've always been the mother hen. So, like, uh, maybe that's just, like, a woman thing. I don't know. But um, I always feel like I have to take care of everybody else. And, like, every single time, like, we go out. It, something always happens and like there I am. So I'm yeah. I'm happy about that. Um yeah. But Sweet. chewing tobacco, like that's that's my vice. So like there there are worse things. There's people that 
binge eat or there's people that are alcoholics and right. I'm like, you know what? Like everything else in my life is pretty calculated and clean for the most part, especially now um, since I'm in prep. But uh, this is like my one dirty thing, I guess. So dirty, <laughs> <laughs> dirty, dirty um, thing. So um, when you got out of the army, you decided like, hey, this is like I'm done with this because my knee is shot. So did you get like a medical board or you just got out and said I'm done? So yeah, uh, medical board, it took like six months. It was really, really fast. Yeah. And and here's the here's silver lining I was talking about earlier. It was the combination of like me blowing out my knee and I'm like, okay, rehab. And then rehab wasn't hard enough. Like I wasn't getting better faster. And I'm just like, how can I get better faster? So I just like Google stuff. I'm like, okay, I could do this leg press variation. I'm like, okay, I could eat this. Like, okay, cool. And um, that's when I was like at the gym a lot at the, our like our sport gym a lot. And I was just bugging the the head coach about questions and things. And he was like, blah, 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 blah. And um, like, Okay, cool. So I try trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. I'm like, okay, my knee really hurts. Let's not do that again. Yeah. Um, but eventually I got better. Was there like a, you know, one, two, three, four, five. These are the exercises. And here's the periodization of this program. And this is going to accelerate your recovery a lot faster. No, I, I figured that over time. And, um, and then I was a strength coach. Um, then I learned so much because like, just training the football guys compared to the lacrosse guys compared to the tennis guys or the basketball girls. Um, it's completely different. Like, Oh, there's so many like sports performance. Like there's so many different exercises, um, to, to optimize their sport. Um, so I knew in the army when I was in the army, like, Hey, when I get out, like, that's what I want to do. I want to be a strength conditioning coach. And, um, and then like even like training up for like all army and stuff like that on my own like i'm like cool i have a, a good idea of what i need to do in order to be successful there and yeah. i actually ended up playing better when i wasn't in college than um and i played better uh and i jumped higher it's fun it's cool to see like the pictures i have from college to two years ago like even yeah. with a messed up knee when i didn't have a mess up knee, i jumped higher when i had a fucked up knee than I did when I didn't have a fucked up knee. Um, and I'm like, that's all due to training. Yeah. Um, so I was like, all right, I need to get my master's. My undergrad is not going to get me a job in the strength conditioning world. Like I know nothing about kinesiology. Um, all I know is how to lift weights and take pre-workout and that's it and be a meathead basically. <laughs> so, um, I go to university of Mary Hardin Baylor. It's a very small, um, Christian school. Mm-hmm. Um, when people are like, why didn't you go to UT? Like, why didn't you go to like Baylor? And I thought about it and I sent in my applications and I got, you know, accepted and their class sizes were like 200 kids. And I'm like, "Mm, I need, I need more attention, you know, (laughs) my classes now, like we maybe have like eight or nine or 10 folks in the class. And, um, I get that individual attention that I need, especially since my undergrad is not kinesiology. A lot of these kids are going from their undergrad to their master's program and they have this background knowledge of kinesiology. And I'm like, I'm learning undergrad and graduate level things at the same time. Yeah. So, and I'm in the accelerated program right now too. Oh girl, get <laughs> so, it. So like my life right now is like study, gym, uh, I do some like professional development, uh, coaching calls, um, and I train clients on the side, sports performance, I have a mom right now and I have two more on the way, but, um, that's my life. That's cool. And it's though. pretty like until, um, I get the job that I want and I'm still trying to what's figure your, that out. What's your dream job? Dream job to work for the human performance uh, program at Fort Bragg um, for the, the SF folk. Um, and it's kind of like a recent realization. So like some people just, they just have a straight path. Okay, this is what I'm gonna do. And um, these are the credentials that I need and I'm gonna go do the thing. And I'm like, well, I thought I wanted you know to be in the army and I really wanted to be a sapper company commander. Like that was, that was my dream job. I'm like, okay, I got redirected. So it's funny how life kind of takes you on this journey. For sure. 
And it was a recent realization because, I mean, I like shooting guns. Like my fiance, he works for, uh, he was an infantry officer in the army and he just got out in November and he works for Chark Systems. They're up in uh, Mansfield, Texas. And it's a more professional um, firearm company. Yeah. And, um, you know, like Black Rifle Coffee Company, they kind of yeah. promote the girls and the, the boobs and, you know, the... Not girls and boobs. No, oh, man. it's terrible. Sex sells? Dang it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they wanted to be a professional i really i maybe i'm just biased but like they they're very professional but they're witty about some of the things yeah, that they post on witty, instagram yeah. Yeah, that's cool. um and i think that's like a true test of intelligence i think if you're able to kind of like construct your words where it's funny and then you make them think about the thing you actually want them to think about that's yeah. boom like you you sold me yeah. um so i mean i always like shooting guns like hello i'm in the army but um it wasn't by going to the range and like shooting at a target. I'm like, this is so boring. And then we went to a training event um, a couple months ago and we were like running around with like the SWAT, some SWAT team guys came and some like army reserve guys came and we're like running around doing these drills. I'm like, I like this. It's the physical piece and you're shooting um, a weapon and keeping up a rifle during like a box drill shooting at a steel target is really really hard so like i gained more respect for um like swat team folk that have to like keep their their weapons up um like the entire time they're doing whatever they need to do but doing their swat stuff. doing their swat stuff <laughs> uh police officer stuff um but i'm like oh cool like i could really you know get into this and then yeah. i made i forgot how i made contact with rick hogg from Hog Tactical, but we ended up having a conversation on the phone for an hour, and he was telling me about his experiences being um, Special Forces um, soldier and his issues with TBI. He's and one of the coolest dudes I've ever met. He's just he's yeah. just so raw, and like yeah. that's that's where I like really appreciated him because yeah. like he was just like he just gave me all of this valuable information because he's just like. I don't fucking care. I just want to tell the world about this and the world needs to know more about this in this community. And I'm yeah. like, yes. And you told me about TBI. I'm like, you know, I heard about TBI and like PTSD and, yeah. and all that. And like now, like right now I'm doing research on omega-3 supplementation and TBI and uh, made a post about that. And it just got blown up everywhere. And like veterans from all over the country are like DMing me my phone at one point I had like 30 like DMs and I'm like oh god like I can't <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that cool like I'm not I'm not that far in my graduate program yet but um but I'm like I could really like uh, inspire like a section of the army of the military community of the veteran community through this way totally. and um and not raising awareness. I hate that. Ugh. Like these <laughs> raising awareness events. Like, cool. So what are we, what's the, what's the plan? What's the task? What's the purpose? And what's the outcome? Right. right. I think like a lot of like my systems thinking, like I think very op order, like, right. and um, I'm like, we need to do something about it. Like, so if we do this research and he told me that there's like a TBI um, clinic in Houston, I'm like, okay, I really want to go down there and go talk to them and, um, what are natural ways of healing vets? What are natural ways of healing these like ex law enforcement guys, um, SWAT team guys? And a really cool thing that he brought up was like, okay, like, you know, folk that are deployed, they're like 100% engaged all the time because they're deployed. Right. Just imagine these guys that have to go home every single day. They have to be able to turn on and turn off that, that switch every yeah. single day. So I'm like, God, we could like really make uh something out of this like um obviously i need to get my my degree and get that like little ms on the side of my name but totally. um digging in into that avenue a lot um and that's what i'm like okay cool if i like take this like natural healing because like even at the va i have to go to the va like every once in a while just be like hey i'm alive cool see you later um my knee's still fucked up but all right <laughs> <laughs> but you see these guys just you know, going to the VA and they're coming out with like this bag of drugs. Yeah, man. And I, um, 
I, I, it just makes me so sad. And I'm just like, why aren't we promoting more like holistic uh, living and eating and regular exercise? It's all about money. And I know. And if the pharmaceuticals have stocks in the government. The government has stocks in these like refined carbs, like Kellogg's or General Mills stocks. And it's just a big fucking circle jerk, basically. For it's sure. all about money. Yep. And um, I think there are some benefits to certain pharmaceuticals to get you to a point where you're able to like rehab and then like be aware of like, okay, I'm, if you have severe PTSD, okay, let's bring you down to this level. And then, then we could do it rehab holistically, but like, it's just like, take these drugs and you're, you're going to be great. Like your back's going to feel fantastic. Well, if you're, if you have no muscle mass, you're gonna feel like shit the next day. Right. So I'm like, okay, exercise physiologist, clinical exercise physiologist slash strength coach slash physical therapist. If there's a job like that out there, please, you know, let me know. But like, I think <laughs> like, yeah. I either need to open up my own practice or, um, you know, knock on the, the door at the human performance program for the SF folk or even, you know, like in Dallas uh, with the SWAT team folk um, to help them out. Yeah, I'm super um, passionate about that because I think it's like a because uh, I've lived it, you know, like I, as far as like, you know, the six back surgeries and being on every drug you can possibly imagine, every opiate, every pain pill, every anti-anxiety pill, sleeping pills, you name it. And it was like you get part you, like you get hooked into a system and then all of a sudden once you're part of it, it's hard to break out of it. And so, like, I, I always tell people, like, especially in the veteran community where it's like guys have issues, whether it be PTSD, whether it be just injuries. And then they get on the all these pills. It's like now you have more problems than what you started with. And so for me, it really took like a lot of like introspection to be like, okay, like I'm not my best self when I'm all fucked up. I don't want to be in pain, but like I I don't even know if I'm in pain anymore because yeah. I'm so jacked up on all this shit. So like I just quit it all cold turkey. Like it was like no, I'm done. And like everyone in my family, like doctors, everyone was like, dude, you're an idiot. Like you need to wean yourself off. Like you've been on all this stuff for like nine years. Like it's not smart. Um, but I just, I don't know. I knew I needed to be done and I was willing to die to be done. I was like, I don't care if it kills me. Like I'm done. Like, I don't want to take this anymore. I'm, I'm tired of it. And, um, yeah, so I quit it all cold Turkey and I had, you know, three seizures after, and it was terrible. Jeez. Um, the first year after all that shit was like probably the, one of the worst years of my life. Like I was, I was like tortured, you know, like I was, my hands were all shaky. I felt like I had like MS or something. Like I couldn't stop shaking. Mm -hmm. So I like carry tennis balls with me, to like squeeze them and you know, whatever. So I can get over the shaking. Um, and I just felt like I was like in a constant, like out of body experience. Like I didn't feel like real. I felt like everything was just a dream. Like I was in a dream world. It was like gnarly. And so th that became like kind of my passion to like teach people like, you can get out of it. Like, it's just going to take a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work and fortitude and discipline discipline, and all these other things. So like, just say, fuck it. Like sometimes you just have to say, fuck it and just do it. And that's kind of where I was. And so like now, you know, with, especially in the veteran community, it's like, I like to promote holistic stuff. I'm a huge proponent of medical marijuana. I'm a huge proponent of CBD because I know it fucking works. Yeah. I take CBD every night. Yeah. Like, I it works. terrible sleep. Like I can't sleep. Yeah. And it's one of those things where like not a lot of people, especially when it comes to medical marijuana, a lot of people don't want to talk about it because of the stigma that surrounds it. Like, oh, I'm just a stoner, bro. I'm just like getting stoned. And it's like, listen, okay, you can take all these opiates and all these other drugs that are completely thrashing your system that are not intended for like- And make you constipated. Okay? Yeah, for sure. Oh, for sure. Pooping is sure. very important. Let's, let's make Definitely. that a note here. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, I'm glad you brought that up. No, that, that was a serious is. issue. Like my digest my digestive tract was completely like shut down when I was on all those drugs. And, um, so, you know, so you're talking like Emina, uh, em Eminas, em am I saying it right? Enema? Enema. Yeah. So all that shit, like, I mean, pun intended, um, <laughs> it's like, I mean, it's a real thing and it's like, it's funny. And it causes I, I can, weight gain. Right. I can laugh about it now, but like, I look at pictures of like when I was on all that shit, like what I look like. And I was like showing my wife and I was like, look at these pictures. And she was like, you don't even look like the same person. Like you don't even look like doesn't even look like you. Like the face, like all bloated out. Um, my, you know, just I was disgustingly fat. Um, and I gotta see this picture. Yeah, it was gnarly, and I was like, and I was just miserable, like internally, mentally, physically. Like I just didn't feel good, and so that's why, like after this last back surgery, um, I was bummed about having it. Like fuck, I have to have another surgery. This is not cool. 
how can I avoid this? Okay, well, I can't feel my feet. I can't feel my legs. Like I need to like, I need to do something. So, um, so I went ahead and just did it like, cause I wanted to like fix the bad surgeries. The five before that were terrible. So I was like, this guy's really good. I trust him. It's Cedar Sinai. Let's do it. But I was like, dude, I cannot get on all these drugs again. I, there's no way I can't do it. And so uh, I told my wife, I was like, Hey, I'll take the drugs like while I'm in the hospital that they give me. But like the minute I leave the hospital, psh, it's that's done. what I did. A second knee surgery. Done. I dumped the, whatever it was down the toilet. I was like, no, yep. I'm not doing this. So I, I uh, got home and, and sweated out like a freaking, a, a white dude. And, and, you know, the, you know, uh, what do you call that? Uh, like the Saharan desert, man, just like running a marathon because like I was so sweaty from fighting the pain off mm -hmm. like every night and it was like absolutely terrible. And I didn't, I didn't even use CBD or uh, any medical marijuana or anything like that. When I was recovering, it was just water and, and grit and discipline. Um, cause I wanted to prove to myself like mentally that I could do it. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I, that was the, see my back surgery. And then I had two knee surgeries, no pain pills and then hemorrhoidectomy, no pain pills. Jesus. And um, <laughs> the uh, the hemorrhoidectomy was like, and it's funny because I'm 37 years old. And people are like, do you got hemorrhoidectomy? And you're like in your 30s. Yeah, dude. That's what happens when you're fucking taking a copious amount of opiates and you can't shit. Like, that's what happens. Uh, yeah, this is real. Like, it creates a lot of problems that aren't cool, you know, that nobody wants to talk about. It's embarrassing and it sucks. Um, I'll talk about poop all day. And yeah. It is very important. Yeah, but it's like. Dude, like, so when I had the hemorrhectomy, it was, the doctor was like, oh my God, this will be the worst pain you've ever experienced. Like, there's no way. Cause he was trying to fill the, the prescription for like the pain pills. And I was like, I don't need it. And he's like, oh, you're going to need it. Trust me. And then, so I like was talking to my grandma about it and she was like, oh, I had one. And it like, you can't even smile. It hurts, you know, like whatever. And I was like, I don't give a fuck. So, um, yeah, I did that surgery and then the knee surgeries and then the back surgery all without pain pills. And, um, so I knew after the back surgery, I was like, okay, dude, like I'm onto something. Like mindset is everything. Mm -hmm. I could I could do anything I set my mind to. So I was like, how can but, I share that? But I think there's a because there's definitely people that that like that label of being disabled. Totally, they, they want it's our identity. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I'm just kind of like uh, playing the devil's advocate here, right? So. I could promote these things and, you know, show pictures and results and, and everything, but like, that's their identity. That's, I guess that's kind of like the reality and like, who am I for not people feeling sorry for me? Um, and I guess since I've been there and I came over that, I'm like, well, duh, but like it takes other people a certain experience or um, traumatic event to like get over it. It's different stops. Yeah. It's, it's, so that's also like explained to me. It's like, you're on a train stop, right? We're all on a train stop. And like the stop that I got to, when I realized that this just wasn't for me, like all these pain pills and like people feeling sorry for me and me feeling sorry for myself. I was at a certain stop where I was ready to be done with that. And that was probably like, at stop two. Well then maybe like the, this person that I'm talking to isn't there yet. They, it's going to take them to like stop six or seven yeah. to get to that point. And that's like for me, like where I've been harnessing like my empathy for people because like mm -hmm. I have not, I don't have much of I'm it. I'm so glad we're going this direction. Yeah, for sure. So like I don't, I struggled with that a lot. And I think a lot of it was as a result of me not really feeling sorry for myself ever. It was like, no, I'm going to I'm gonna crush this and like just being like a mindset warrior. And so then when people, I would see them stuck in that rut, I had a hard time being like, dude. Like, get out of it, snap out of it. Like, you got this, you know? It's like, but people aren't always gonna be where you are, you know? And and that's that's been a learn for me lately. And um, I'm glad that it's happening, you know? So. Um, I just look at people now, like I, whether it's politics, my view on fitness, uh, volleyball, like you name it, the military, like everybody has their own reality. So yeah. like, like you said, like, not that I don't have empathy for people, I have a better understanding. I'm like, okay, you don't understand what I understand. Like I'm looking through this lens based on my experiences and oh. you're looking at your lens based on your experiences. All I could do is present information and make a like a valid argument or a conversation yeah. um, to try to prove it to you otherwise. Yeah. But a lot of people, especially, especially on social media, like people, people only listen to respond rather than like listen to understand right. and i may not agree with a certain viewpoint somebody else has but i try to understand where they they come from so like with people like that like the people that still want to be felt sorry for and play the system um like there's this one soldier i was sitting next to and out processing and i'm like oh you're getting out cool are you done with your contract he's like no i got med boarded out i'm like 
oh man, what happened? I have scoliosis. I got 100%. I'm like, okay, so there's this guy that I saw at the VA, you know, a couple of weeks ago, has le- his leg fucking blown off, yeah. and he has maybe 30%. Like, right. here you are playing the system. So it's just like, I don't know if it's necessarily the VA, like, I don't know if it's the people that they're hiring or kind of like trying to have them like quantify these injuries, especially like TBI. There's no way you could quantify that. Right. There's no way. And that's what makes me so mad the more I like dig into that. Like, well, you only get 10%. I'm like, I don't know how it affects their relationships or their relationship with their their wife or their husband and their, their kids or them at work or themselves or you know, you can't quantify that and you can't put a percentage on that. But there's people at the same time that um, take advantage of that. So it's just like, where where do we draw the line? Like, where, how, how do we compensate these people for what they've been through and what they've done? So once I figure that out, like, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. It's it's definitely like a big conundrum of like people that are like, there are certain people that, that deserve it and that are deserving of it and that have paid their dues and are, you know, they should be compensated for like the shit that they went through. And then there's other people that no, nah, like you're just treating the system and you're a piece of shit. Um, like for me, like I wasn't a, a combat veteran and I, I used to have like guilt about that. Like, do I want me to, too. I do. I still have it. I'm yeah, just like, like, people like, like, Oh, I'm did not, you I'm deploy? Not. I'm like, Nope. Yeah. And I, no, I had a lot of guilt about it. And I, I felt like I, like, it's always that like, I could have done more. I could have done better. I could have done this. Could have, could have, should have, would have. And at a certain point I got to a, a place where I was like, you know what? Who cares? I mean, I did the best that I could while I was there and it didn't work out to where I was deployed. Maybe that's that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a good thing that I didn't. You know what I mean? But I can tell you that some of the relationships that I that I um, established while I was in the military, some of the best relationships I've ever had in my life, you know, and I'm still oh, in contact I, with most of those people. You I'm know? closer. I had a soldier. Um, he died in a car accident a couple weeks ago. And my grandma's died like last year. I was like, okay, you know, it's her time to go. My grandfather died when I was at West Point. I'm like, eh, he was an old fucker. And like, it was his time. <laughs> it was his time to go. But like, huh. one one of my uh, NCOs, he called me, and I just I went to my car and I stayed in my car and I cried. Huh. I was sob. I'm tearing up right now. I was sobbing. Huh. Um, because like that, he was my very one of my very first soldiers, and he those were my kids. Like my soldiers were my kids and my NCOs were my brothers. And like, I'm closer with my platoon than I was with my own family. And it's just like, and like you said, like, yeah, I'm not a um, combat vet, but I did the best that I could. And what I know I did very well was one, earn the respect of my platoon and take care of them. Yeah. And that was the best I could do at the time. Um, So, oh God. How did you, uh, (laughs) How did you end up um, when you got out and you were like, you know, like, I'm not done yet. I have more that I want to do, you know, because you can tell, like, just by talking to you, you're a smart woman. And like, you're like, oh, I'm going to go get my graduate degree. And like, what was the passion behind that? Like, what was like the catalyst to be like, I need to do something more? Um, Because I love the military and just because my time wasn't the best, um, maybe the branch I was in or the jobs that I had wasn't suited best for me Mm -hmm. um so i'm like okay what's like another way i can help these guys out and um whether it's like personal training or like nutrition or um gosh just like bringing bringing awareness and doing something about it (laughs) and but actually doing something about it we could really make an impact that way um i just i love soldiers i love uh, just the camaraderie. I miss that a lot. Oh, for sure. Um, I just miss hanging out with my platoon. Like I would get in trouble because I would hang out with my platoon in the motor pool rather than doing, you know, changing a color on a PowerPoint slide right. or some bullshit presentation for an M4 range, which I'm like, I could literally like pull an op order for M4 range out of my ass right. and we just go shoot some round, rounds down range and then come back. Um, the arm is a lot different than what I learned at West Point. Uh, that's like most things, right? Like, I mean, yeah, even like when you go to like a recruiter, even it's like, hey, like this yeah. is going to be your job. Like they asked me what I wanted to do in the Air Force. And I was like, to shoot guns and kill people. I mean, that's really what I said. Like, as that, I was like that's why you're that's what people like. Right. That's what society does not want to accept. When you're signing that line, you're that line with like you're going to join the military, whatever branch it is. Like you're signing your life away and you're you are willing to kill somebody else. Yeah, for, absolutely. 
for this country. So 100%. I'm just like, why are we sugarcoating shit? Like, right. stop. So he's like, you know what? I got the job for you, man. So he shows me this, like, I think on at the time it was like on a VHS tape or something. And it was like these guys driving around on, uh, you know, quads with like, you know, guns and they were riding yeah. like dirt bikes. And like, it was like, <laughs> USA, fuck yeah. And, um, <laughs> And it was like, you know, for security forces, you know, being a cop. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, dude, totally, bro. Like, where do I sign, bro? I'm not fucking do it, you know? <laughs> and like my my stepdad was in the Marines and then he went to the Marines, uh, from the Marines into the Air Force and uh, into the reserve. So like I had been around the military, mm-hmm. um, but we never like talked about it really. I didn't really talk to my stepdad about like the recruiters or whatever. Like when I went to sign up, I just went. Like I didn't even talk to my grandma about it. My grandma pretty much raised me, but I didn't like even tell her or anybody really i just went down i was like i was stuck working at a working loss prevention at a sporting goods store and i was like dude all like my buddies are like going to college like after high school and i was like i'm gonna be that guy that's going to high school parties and like you know like just hanging yeah seriously (laughs) like ill is right and i was like dude i'm gonna be that guy that's just hanging out and i'm gonna be like stuck in this city and i'm not gonna leave i'm just gonna be this big loser and it scared the fuck out of me. I was like, oh, dude, this is scary. And so I think I'm pretty positive. It was either that day or the next. I left work and was like, no, nah, I'm going to the recruiter. So I, when I walked in, we talked. I told him, I was like, dude, I'll be the easiest, easiest recruit you've ever had. Like, I, I, you can tell me it's going to be the Where worst. Where do I sign right now? Yeah, don't seriously. even tell me. I don't, you can tell me it's going to be the worst experience ever. And I'm still going to I'm still going to join. Um, and so I did. I was like, yeah, that is what it is. But um, and I want to get into this uh, bikini or I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm offending you by saying bikini competition. Is that what it's called? Is it a physique competition or bikini competition? It's bikini. It has like different classes. Okay. Uh, I love it. So how did you get into it and why did you get into it? So after, I guess after college and all you've been training for up at that point is to play volleyball. Right. Uh, college volleyball ends. And even though I played in the army, like, it's like, what do I do now? Right. Like, what, what's my, um, what's my fitness journey that all these like Instagram, uh, booty band models post on their booty Instagram. Band. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. And, uh, for me, I have to have, have very specific goals and I reach that goal. I'm like, okay, now I go to the next goal. So, um, I was just like, I want to try all the things. So, uh, I ran a half marathon on a fucked up. I got third place in my class, though. That was cool. Uh, I've done, God, I've done CrossFit. I've done, I've literally done anything and everything you could think of. I, I just love looking up research, and I love just, like, anything on the Internet. I find, like, I get inspiration from it. I follow a lot of uh, sports performance um, pages. You follow like, Jeff Nichols? I think. Jeff CSCS on Instagram? My name's Jeff. Just plugged him right now. Jeff is uh, is definitely a guy, um, certified uh, strength and conditioning specialist that is uh, top notch. And the, I mean, I I'm, I'm not, I mean, I don't know if it's like kinesiology or if it's exercise physiology. I don't, I don't know what it's all, all the stuff is called, you know, because it's not my field. Um, I just know that as far as like exercise and fitness and um, performance, um, he's the guy like in the community and the veteran. He's doing a lot in the veteran community. Um, working with law enforcement, uh, guys prepping to go to, you know, buds or mm-hmm. special forces or whatever. And um, he's a, he'd be a great guy for you to get in contact with. Just DM sure. here. I'm going to work for you. You, you just wait. No, I mean, one, one more year, sir. For sure. He'd be the guy. Um, and then, but anyway, so you got into, you got into it because you wanted to like push yourself and you're like, Hey, I, I want to do something different. Yeah. I was just, yeah. I just want to do something different and kind of step out of my comfort zone. Cause I've always been, uh, even now, like I have a very hard time, uh, it's gonna sound weird, but being like sexy, like just being a woman, I guess, because I'm very like doodly. I walk like a football player. <laughs> like, and I'm, that's completely out of my comfort zone. Like, I'm on stage, there's lights on me. Like, I'm already 6'1, right. so I put those heels on. I'm like 6'7. Right. I'm over exaggerating. <laughs> um, makeup, and I, you know, I still suck at makeup. Uh, and hair that's why i'm wearing a hat right now <laughs> um but it's just something different a different challenge because like volleyball has its own challenges okay cool like marathon training has its different challenges okay cool like crossfit whatever blah blah, blah. i'm like okay so um i got into that and uh i did my first show last year and um i'm not to talk bad about my coach i i really don't want to talk about him, about him at all but like i was starved 
Yeah. It was like a 20, it was a 24, 20 week prep. I was starved the whole time, but I didn't know. Like that was, right. I know sports performance and military training. And I know, I know all that Olympic lifting. I knew nothing about the bikini world yeah. or the, the bodybuilding world. Um, so I like followed the plan and I got on stage and did my thing and I was, God, my hormones were fucked up. Like I didn't have a period for, I know it's really gross to talk about, sorry. It's all good, dude. Um, I just called you dude too. <laughs> do that. Um, <laughs> uh, and my hormones were out of whack and just, uh, and I had this like basically eating disorder. Like if yeah. I felt like if I ate more than I was supposed to, even post show, like I would take a laxative right. or I just want to eat or I would do these like three hour workouts and just exhaust myself. And I was trying to stay below this like 10%. Like I have this like stigma in my mind. Like I have to be below 10% body fat and it just wasn't good and um then that was the time where i got out of the military like i did my first show got out of the military like a month later and then we moved to georgetown um because charles my fiance he thought he was going to be working in georgetown now he commutes to dallas like every week it's really funny um so i get the house to myself which is nice sorry babe <laughs> but um we went to georgetown and i work well, I train people out of the house of gains. I love that gym. And I met um, my coach now, John, and like, he's got, he's putting like 2,600 calories in me like a day. Nice. And uh, I just feel better. Like uh, everything's in sync mentally. I'm not exhausted. Um, so prep is a lot easier than what people think. Yeah. Um, because that's like my reality. Um, and yeah, it's just like, it's my niche right now. So now the next thing, my next niche I want to do is uh, train up for the tactical games. Um, I'm going to go kind of recon that in March to kind of like see what they're doing, how to train, um, and prep for that. But um, I think it's really important to always have like a, a goal because there's some, you know, there's some people that just go to the gym and they work out and they're fine. I'm like, cool. I'm like, I have to reach something. So then I could go even higher and then I reached that goal and I could go even higher um, and bikini and it might seem narcissistic, but like those women that I train with and that compete are probably the most authentic people I've ever met because yeah. you're going through the same shit. Like women to each other in the military, we're just so catty. Like, my God, I get along more with these girls that put on makeup every day and have fake boobs than I do with these <laughs> chicks that are like in the same foxhole that I that I'm in. So I'm like, what's going on? So, um, so you kind of found that camaraderie again. Yeah, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's super cool. And my gym, like I I love my gym. I love my coach. I love my gym. I love the people there. It's it's really cool. And uh, it's a it's a big veteran community. Um, so I see a whole bunch of vets all the time. They're doing the whole bodybuilding thing, and I was like, that's cool, man. So they found their niche again, their comrade source of camaraderie, basically. Um, yeah, it's just like my home, you know. Yeah, for sure. And you'd belong to something. I get that, man. What's the um, what's the best way for people to connect with you if they want to link up with you? Um, Instagram. Okay. Um, that's the best way. I'm on Facebook, but I'm kind of not on Facebook at the same. Like, I'm, I'm trying like to get better. Like I'm trying to get better yeah, at it. Both. Um, I think that's like a platform that's slowly dying. Um. But Facebook owns Instagram. Yeah, so anyway, uh, Instagram is the best way. Um, At Megan Wilton. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You guys see that? I'm not, not going to M E G A N W I L T O N. Did I do that right? Was that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Damn, I'm good. You didn't say Wilson. That's good. <coughs> I get telemarketers. Oh, is Miss Wilson there? No, I don't know no, who it is. <laughs> don't know Miss Wilson. Sorry. <laughs> Gotta go. <laughs> No, well, so. that's cool. So yeah, if you guys want to link up with uh, with Megan, you can hit her up on Instagram at Megan Wilton, and um, you know maybe uh, you can like hook me up with like some prep stuff so I can get my fat ass back into prep, you know. tactical training, sport. I mean, I don't know if there's like super old adult. No, I'm kidding. Adult Dude, leagues. You, <laughs> Dude, come on. <laughs> I don't know. I think I was super old, like six back surgeries, like totally beat up guy. I don't think there's anything for you. Sorry, bud. The guys that live vicariously through their high school football days. Yeah. Uh, oh, for God, sure. I could throw man. a football quarter mile. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Rico right here. So. Nah, that, well, that's super cool. I'm really glad that uh, we were able to do this podcast and, and link up. Um, like I said, I was fascinated by the fact that, I mean, the West Point thing is, it's a big deal because like, 
you may not think it's a big deal, but I think from people outside of that world, um, they do because it's like not, it's hard to get into school like that. It's very hard and it's challenging to get through it. Like it's like being in fucking boot camp for four years and that sucks. But the last um, point I do want to make about like those like prestigious schools and just like having a college degree in general, like yeah. just because you have a piece of paper with your name on it with yeah. a degree, like that's cool and all, it's what you do with that degree. Totally. Like just because you went to a leadership institution does not mean you are a leader. Um, and just because you have a 2.0 compared to a, a chick or a guy that has a 4.0 doesn't mean like you can't like doesn't mean like the guy with a 4.0 is going to be a good leader right. like the guy with a 2.0 and I've seen it many time time again including myself like yeah. it doesn't matter um, yeah. it's what you do with that degree is what matters I dig it so super cool well, thank you again <clears throat> for coming on the show. And um, thank you for any, having me. I feel like yeah, the, for sure. the penny of the Big Bang Theory crew that you recruit Stop on this show. It. I'm just Stop like, uh. <laughs> no, I think it's super cool. And if there's anything that I can ever do to promote you and what you're doing, um, I, I'll be more than happy. To, I mean, I don't know how I can help you, but I would be more than willing to. Um, and uh, I look forward to linking up with you again because I'll be back in Texas for sure. Absolutely. You have to come to Georgetown, go to the Monument Cafe. Definitely. Are you going to stay in Texas? Do you plan on staying here? Yeah. I mean, I'm, obviously, well, if for, I get my dream uh, job, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going, but uh, I love Texas. Never going back to California. Good ever. For you. Good, <laughs> good for you. I like my guns. So, well, thank you yeah. again. And I look forward to linking up with you soon. Thanks for having me. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thank you for listening to My Backstory. Stay motivated and stay connected off the show. Follow at my underscore backstory underscore to be a part of the journey to recovery and to see where your story goes. Or visit us online at hereismybackstory.com.